fellow listeners, and welcome back to Sandman Stories Presents. Today we have another story of old Korea. Now usually the author, W.E. Griffiths, is retelling a story that has been told to him, and he tries to keep things true with only minor changes here and there. But this one he really puts his foot in it. To be honest, I recorded this one once before, and I had to redo it, just because I was a bit surprised by what he wrote. So, just as a little disclaimer, Koreans cannot be painted by a broad brush, and when you ascribe an attribute such as laziness or ignorance to a whole group of people, you are doing a lazy racism, and you need to stop it. Also, I edited a few of his sentences because it makes it flow better, because he gets very long-winded, and it makes it hard to read. So, here goes the story again. Cat Kin and the Queen Mother Korea is called the land of the plum blossom, but in winter, the rivers freeze over. Then the men cut through the ice, which is often several feet thick, to catch with their fishing lines and hooks the fish that swim in the waters beneath. Yet they are very glad to welcome any sign of the coming spring, and they watch eagerly for the pussy willows to show themselves. Now there was a farmer who lived in Napo, which is in the grain garden of the Korean peninsula and he wanted a little daughter, though other parents cared more for sons. One day, Farmer Pak, for that was his name, discovered a pussy willow, which seemed to him after the long winter like a light shining in a dark place. He plucked it and carried it proudly home, this branch full of fuzzy little buds. This was a sign of his happiness at the return of spring. He was tired of ice and snow, and now he knew that soon the gloomy hills would burst into a glory of bright colors. The blooming flowers would look like an army with flags. That same day his prayers were answered, and a little girl was born into his home. Giving the pussy willow to his wife, he said, We shall name our baby Catkin, that is, Little Puss. Catkin never saw a cradle, for the Korean mothers carry their babies on their backs. She was soon out of infancy, and then it was not long before she was standing up and toddling about and playing with her doggy and pet bull. These little pets on four legs usually take the place of kittens in the country home of Korea, for the cats are wild and do not allow children to fondle them. Long before she was a dozen years old, Ketkin became very fond of fairy stories, of which Korea has a great many, besides thousands of tales of wonderful people and animals and what happened to them. She often looked up towards the high hills and distant mountains, where she thought the fairies, dragons, ogres, and tigers lived. Here also dwelt the Sanin, or mountain spirits, wise and good, of whom the old people talked, and the soldiers painted on their banners when they went to war. When about eight years old, Ketkin wanted very much to walk up towards the North Star, which her father showed her shining in the heavens. He had once traveled up into the northern provinces, where during the daytime he could see afar off to the great snow-white mass of the ever-white mountain rising up to meet the azure sky. There at the top he had heard lay the Dragon Prince's pool, out of which flowed the two rivers that made Korea an island. One was named the Tumen and the other the Yalu, after the beautiful green and blue sheen of the feathers of the drake's back, so richly colored were its shining waters. When her father told her of his travels, Ketkin also longed to go up north to get to the very top and touch the sky. But this she knew she could not do, even if she had had long legs and were as strong as a man, for the tigers were very numerous and always roaming about. These yellow and black striped brutes were man-eaters. They loved nothing better for a good dinner than a young girl. She did not know any way of getting to the top of the Everwhite Mountain, and seeing the deep blue waters of the pool. Only by riding on the back of a dragon, which she sometimes dreamed of, could she ever get there. She kept waiting and waiting for one of these flying creatures to come, yet it never came. Ketkin was bound to have the fairies visit her, if possible. So one day, as she sat under a persimmon tree reading a story, with the book in one hand, She struck the ground several times, saying earnestly, Earth Spirit, Earth Spirit, come to me. Come up and see me. 
All of a sudden the air seemed heavy with sweet perfume, and a silver mist like a cloud spread over her house and garden. Then a bright dazzling light flooded everything, and there stood before her a glistening chariot with wheels made of blue jade trimmed with gold. It was drawn by milk-white horses, and on a seat of shining silver sat the western heavenly queen mother herself. Attending upon the mother queen were thousands of the most beautiful maidens who were all dressed in resplendent robes. They wore amber ornaments and silver girdles and necklaces of precious stone. They were adorned with silken robes and tassels, and on their feet were gold embroidered velvet slippers, and on their heads were caps of gold studded with glittering gems. Catkin could hardly count the rich ornaments, the necklaces, the brace chains, and the scepter-like jade wands. They were in the shape of lotus flowers in their hands. The faces of all the maidens were rosy and their eyes sparkled and all had small hands and feet. The heavenly queen mother looked at Catkin and spoke to her in a voice of great sweetness that sounded like music, saying, Come forward, little maid. Fear not, and I shall take you with me to my palace. In the island of gems and give you all you want and also showering blessings on your people if you will come. Catkin did not at all feel timid or frightened but came forward boldly and knelt at the base of the chariot. The mother queen first touched her with her milk white jade wand and made the girl rise. In a moment more a silver chariot with wheels made of turquoise and drawn by two young opal dragons wheeled up close to her and the attendant lady in the golden robes bade her step in. The dragons were fierce, powerful, fire-breathing creatures with wide-spreading wings, and their bodies and tails together were the length of whales, while their eyes darted fire. Yet Catkin was not at all afraid, and thought it was great fun. Then up through and far above the clouds, the host of the bright beings flew. They followed the Queen Mother's chariot until far away they poised in mid-sky. Catkin was then told to look over the side of the chariot to the earth and oceans and miles and miles below. She was asked if she could recognize her father's cottage, but she could not. The whole village looked like a gray mass of thatched roofs, and she could barely pick out the temple. There, spread out before her, was the great blue sea, as blue as a sapphire and deep green like an emerald. But she could see no ships, nor any coast or shores, ranges of mountains, nor signs of the land of Korea. Nothing but ripples and waves were visible, yet in the center of the Cerulean Sea was an island. The trees were emeralds, and the roofs of the houses were made of gold, and the windows diamonds. The homes were so full of light that no lamps were necessary. The beautiful maidens, as lovely in garb and face as those who filled the train of the Queen Mother, walked, played, and sang in the gardens. Some swam and sported in the sapphire waves, or rowed and sailed about in boats that were so white that they seemed to be made of marble. At a signal from the Queen, the singing ceased. Then there rose wave upon wave of the sweetest melody from the instruments in the gardens below. Catkin thought she had heard the chorus at intervals, sounding out the words, rising up like pulses through the air. Welcome, lovely mortal. Our queen invites, and we greet you. Manifold be her gifts to you and yours. Come, you are most honored among all Korean maidens. Come to us and join our band, and we shall love you as one of ourselves. In the wink of a falcon's eye, the queen mother and her host descended. As the chariots touched the island, a bevy of radiant maidens came forward, some to attend to the Queen Mother, and some to lead Catkin into her own room in the palace. There the most gorgeous robes were put on her, along with a cap glittering from precious stones of various colors, and a pair of gold-embroidered velvet slippers. Catkin was surprised when one of the shining maidens set a royal tiara adorned with five gems upon her brow. For me? she asked in surprise. Yes, for you, whom the heavenly queen mother would honor. And what do these five gems, jade, crystal, malachite, amber, and quartz signify? asked Catkin. Ah, that is not for us to tell you, but the queen mother, 
Who ordered these? Tomorrow she will explain to you the secrets of each gem. Ketkin walked about freely, enjoying the lovely sights and sounds. She also ate from the delicacies set on the table before her, with a keen appetite until she was full. Yet not once did she feel sleepy, nor see any beds, nor hear anyone talk of sleep. She wondered what they meant when they said tomorrow, for she could see no sun or moon or twilight. However, she did not long think about such things, and by and by forgot all about them. When the entire court and all the hosts of the queen's mother attendants had assembled, Her Majesty's Chamberlain read the proclamation. It declared that the queen looked with great favor upon the Korean people, and that she had decided to bestow great gifts upon them. For this purpose, she selected and brought to her palace the Korean maid named Katkin. She wanted to endow them through her, their daughter, with five precious traits of disposition and character. In token of gracious thought and tender love, Her Majesty now presented and explained the meaning of the five precious gems. They were jade, crystal, malachite, amber, and quartz. Katkin knelt down before the queen, who placed the shining gems in Katkin's hands, while an attendant fairy carefully plucked them from her open palm and placed each one of them on carmine velvet laced in gold. Then five maidens stood by, each with a gem laid on a cushion. After the ceremony of presentation was over, the queen made a speech which told the maiden's fortune and her future. Katkin would be sent back over the clouds and ocean to the king's palace in the capital of her homeland, and there be made a princess. Many nobles and princes from other countries, hearing of her beauty and her travels to the island of gems, would come to ask for her hand in marriage. Many would ask to be her husband, to be wedded in holy matrimony, but she was to marry no one but her own king's son, a prince of her people. Take these gems, fair maiden, and bestow their virtues and what they mean upon your people, said the queen. A thousand years from now, as men count time, together we will visit Korea again. Then both the queen and Katkin stepped into the silver chariot, drawn by the fire-breathing dragons, plunged on and mounted up into space. First they sailed above the clouds and then dipped downwards, steering to Korea and over the mountains, bearing their precious charge to the capital. They reached the ground in a cloud, and the wheels of the chariot stood still before the palace gate. Yet before any mortal eyes could see their full forms, the Queen Mother and the dragons had disappeared, and Katkin stood alone. She was a resplendent maiden of dazzling appearance, and in the robes given by the Heavenly Queen Mother, which all recognized at once as coming from the Island of Gems. A throng of court ladies and palace attendants and a long line of nobles and princes were already waiting for the maiden, who knew they came gift-laden from the Queen Mother, of whom all had heard from childhood. The five gems were laid, each in a covered casket of perfumed wood, encrusted with a top and inlaid with mother of pearl. Escorted into the throne room by a bevy of princesses, the Heavenly Mother's gifts in the five caskets were reverently placed on silken fans and spread out upon a table topped with five cushions of crimson velvet. Then by lot and by word of the diviners, the choice of a first drawing was awarded to the prince of fair face and men. The other four nobles, one by one in turn, approached and each was allowed to choose one of the caskets, all of which looked alike, and none was to be opened until the possessor was in his own home. Now these were the gifts of body and mind, of which the polished gems were the tokens. According as each prince chose and received, so with the trait which each gem signified, would his children and posterity be endowed. In the course of centuries, these would become the national features of 20 million Koreans. One by one the caskets were opened by each prince, and therein he discovered what was a trait in the character of the Korean people. These were cleanliness, the proud wearing of the white cloth, for which took too long for the women of the household to make shine like the North Star. This earned them the nickname of the people of the white clothes. Hospitality, always glad to see friends, to entertain people, and even strangers, and to take care of relations, even to the making of oneself poor, in order to make sure that everyone was taken care of. 
Diligence. Oh, the number of hours a laborer puts into his job, and how he makes sure that everything is done and done well. Korean people are especially proud of their abilities, and love to show that they are working hard. Love of family. How the mothers and fathers in Korea do love their children, their kinsfolk, and their relatives. Sense of humor. A Korean can always see the funny side of things. He loves to joke, and he bears his troubles well, because he likes to smile. As for the girls, they laugh as easily as rain falls or the flowers bloom. And what the queen mother predicted came true. Just as five fingers make up the hand, so the average people among the Koreans are known by the five traits, for better or for worse. The end. So I had to change the ending a little. The original had attributed to Koreans the traits of being incorrect and not caring about being incorrect and procrastination as they didn't like to do hard work. Calling a group of people lazy or ignorant it erases their humanity. Uh, I've been welcomed into my wife's home, but also into other friends' homes, which has made landing in Korea a bit softer. Friends like Ingyu and Junsu and Lee Jang have really made my life here in Korea much more comfortable. And I'm fairly sure every culture has people who love their families. So this ending was a bit disappointing. Oh well, they can't all be winners. Okay, and today's podcast shout out is to Field Lab Earth. This is a wonderful podcast if you're into nerding out about soil and agriculture and crop sciences. I came to this pod through Dr. Baliga's Planthropology podcast. And I've been hooked ever since. This pod is great for learning a lot about the soil you step on although it does go into the weeds quite a bit. But if you enjoy planting and knowing about your soil and have a green thumb, this pod is a great resource for getting to know your patch of earth better. You don't have to be a giant science nerd, but it doesn't hurt either. And if you like the podcast as much as I do, go and give them a 5-star rating on Podchaser or Good Pods or iTunes or Spotify. Also, there are quizzes that go with each episode that count towards college credit if you're taking classes. So that is nice too. And the listener shout-out is to Santiago, Chile. On my trip back from Ecuador, I stopped off in the airport in Santiago. I was pleasantly surprised at the amount of German-inspired cuisine in the airport. Also, the view from the airport showed the lovely city with the backdrop of the Andes. It is for sure a place I would like to go back to again. You are 100% of my listeners from Chile, so thank you and good night.